Hello, hello. This is episode 397 of the Keto Diet Podcast. Welcome, welcome. My name is Leanne. I'm a functional blood chemistry specialist, holistic nutritionist, a lady that does many things, including educating on the ketogenic diet. So if you're new around these parts, I'm so excited to have you here. Today is a super special episode. I feel like I say that every time. You know, it's just, it's so lovely to be able to share this knowledge with you and exciting people with you and resources with you. I hope you're really enjoying all of these episodes that I've put together over the years. So I was interviewed recently by Dr. Thomas Hemingway. He hosts Unshakable Health Podcast. And wow, it was such a great episode with just, he asked such great questions that at the end of the interview, I said, hey, Thomas, would you mind if I shared this podcast episode on my podcast? Because I feel like my listeners would love this. He agreed to it, sent me the audio file, and this is what I'm about to share with you. So Thomas is actually interviewing me, and I highly suggest after today's episode, you go and check out Unshakable Health with Thomas Hemingway. He's an MD. He's brilliant. He talks about weight loss, gut health, brain health, sleep, stress, and so much more. His episodes come out every Thursday. They're super entertaining, really informational, and have really clear, actionable steps. And I'm hoping we can have Thomas here on the podcast at some point uh, to talk about his approach to health and the ketogenic diet. And I'm sure he'll have a ton of awesome things to share with us. So in the meantime, check out today's episode, listen, and then go on and follow Thomas Hemingway. He's a great resource for you. Okay, let's cut over to today's interview. Welcome to the Keto Diet Podcast, the show all about keto for women so you can burn fat, balance your hormones, and heal your body. Starting and maintaining keto can be challenging without the right support. So just for listening to the podcast, I want to give you 20% off the keto beginning with the coupon code Keto Podcast. That's all one word. This 30-day program gives you a clear step-by-step how-to so you can quickly adapt to a ketogenic diet, avoid common struggles, and get the results you crave. Go to help healthfulpursuit.com slash begin to get your keto beginning discount today. If you're new around these parts, I'm Leanne Vogel. You may know me as the international bestselling author of The Keto Diet, founder of happyketobody.com, or maybe you know me as the nutritionist that likes dipping pork rinds in avocado oil mayo. I'm so glad you're here with me today. Thanks so much for listening. All right. Super excited for this episode today, guys. Got a great guest that's got a wealth of knowledge, wealth of personal experience, lots of shared experience, who's just truly the consummate professional as far as this field goes. She's big into not only keto, but holistic health for women, especially. And she's just got lots of experience. So we have Leanne Vogel on the show today. She's bestselling author. She's uh, at the healthfulpursuit.com, which is an amazing website. I hope you check out, but welcome Leanne. How are you? Oh my goodness. I'm so well. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Thomas. Oh my gosh. Such a pleasure to have you on the show. I've been uh, looking forward to this because you're such a wealth of knowledge and I just love your personal experience, your story, as well as all the shared experience that you have to contribute. So thanks for being here. We'll get into it. I wanted you to start with just a little bit of your backstory. How did you even get interested in this kind of, you know, low carb thing? And, you know, was that the same that it was today? You know, just what really got you interested in it from the get go? Yeah. So I went off hormonal birth control in 2000. And seven, and I didn't get a period back for eight years total. And around the seventh year, I started thinking maybe this was an issue and I needed to get to the bottom of it. You know, us women, we don't really love our periods. We have like this love hate relationship with it. And um, I had studied holistic nutrition, so I knew how important a period was. And at that point, I just didn't really know where to turn. Doctors were telling me I wouldn't get my period back unless I went on hormonal birth control. That's not a period. Okay. So that's just. <laughs> a breakthrough bleed. The pseudo. Um, exactly, exactly. And so I had to go to the literature and I read and read and read and read and read. And kind of at the same time, a friend had posted an image of hashtag keto on their Instagram. And at that point, nobody was talking about a ketogenic diet. In fact, I looked up my books for nutrition school years before that. And it said, keto equals dangerous. Do not do. That's all I learned (laughs) about the ketogenic diet. So naturally, if somebody tells me not to do something, of course, I'm going to do it. So as a vegan, I had been a vegan for 
pretty much 10 years solid. And I decided, okay, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to eat bacon. I'm going to have coconut oil. I'm going to like get into this thing. And after 30 days, I decided I'd never go back to the way I was eating. And fast forward a year and a half, I got my cycle back. I've now had a period ongoing for seven years. So just as long as I had amenorrhea, I now have a cycle. Um, so that's kind of how I got introduced to it. And over the, you know, I started in 2014. So not only has the ketogenic space changed so much in the last six years, um, but I have changed also. And I've really learned firsthand, even though I tell my clients this all the time, the diet you needed at a certain time is not the diet you're going to need now. It's not the diet you're going to need in 10 years from now. And so I really used a strict ketogenic diet at the beginning to reset my metabolism and then a ketogenic diet that rotated in carbohydrates to get my hormones back online. And now I kind of dabble in a bunch of different things. Like I had potatoes this morning and then I just had a macadamia nut bar for lunch and I probably Yay. won't eat for the rest of the day. And so there's this metabolic flexibility that I did not have at all before. And so it's really transformed everything. And I can be doing much different things than I could have back in 2014 when I was really sick and couldn't do any of those things. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And I can't believe you were that patient. Like, holy crap, seven years with amenorrhea, which is lack of a regular cycle. I mean, seven years, you're like the most patient person on the planet. But like you said, I know with young women, it's a love hate, right? It's like convenient yeah. to not have your period, but Super. you know that it's not awesome for your overall hormonal health to go years and years with, with no period. And, and so <laughs> I loved it that you found a way to, you know, become once again, you know, balanced with your hormones. And then you've kind of experimented along the way, which I think is amazing because like you said, I agree hundred percent, our bodies need something today and it might be a little bit different tomorrow and even more different a year from now. And then the same could be said for the past too. We're not, you know, we're living beings. We're not just lab rats, you know, we change on a daily basis. And so I love that you've kind of come to that with your own experience. I know you've worked with thousands of clients over the years as well. Um, one of the things that I would just love to hear a little bit about, maybe for our listeners, let's just kind of review a couple of terms, if that's okay with you. I've just, I've heard yes. your, your very brief, but no super understandable terminology with respect to what is keto anyway, what is metabolic flexibility, maybe just start in general with just sort of the low carb definition or, or keto and just kind of what's happening physiologically, just to re remind ourselves and help. Yes, our completely. In fact, I was sitting across the table from a kid that asked me what a ketogenic diet was. <laughs> and all my friends heard me describe this and like, you need to write a children's book. <laughs> like, so it's really, it's really important to understand those basics. And I'm so glad that you asked. Basically, there are really two different ways that your body can make energy. Like, we'll make it really simple, right? So there's gluten glucose or fat or ketones. Okay. And so either of these fuel sources can be used. And ideally that metabolic flexibility is being able to use glucose, fat, glucose, fat, and just kind of jump between both like you're playing skip rope. But when we are glucose burners and we've been glucose burners for a long time, we're eating carbohydrates, usually more than 50 grams a day, give or take, depending on your genes and a whole bunch of other things, you are going to burn sugar. Okay. As your energy where we want to kind of set things and reset our metabolism is with the ketogenic diet or to teach, reteach our body, relearn how to burn ketones and use, ke create ketones and use ketones as energy. And so that's what the ketogenic diet looks to achieve is to get your body into that fat burning state where you are able to actually burn the fat as energy. Now there can be issues with that and we can kind of dive in what I've seen clinically with clients who have messed up livers and like require a little bit more um, support because the liver is really involved in this process. But you know, the liver is also in involved in the process of burning sugar. And so overall ketones are going to be a much better fuel source and a much cleaner fuel source than sugar, which is, you know, how I explain it to the kid is like, you could burn on a really, really dirty fuel 
or you could burn on something super clean and great, not only for your body, but the environment. And like, it's just so much better. And so that's really where ketones are. And, and that metabolic flexibility is being able to move and ebb and flow between both and not have hangry feelings or feel terrible. Like many of us do when we don't have food in the morning, or you might feel hangry. Uh, those are some of the symptoms that maybe hint to the fact that you need this metabolic flexibility thing. I found my new favorite snack and it's here to stay. House of Macadamia's seasoned macadamia nuts. They're like chips without the carbs, like seriously. The first time I had a bag of their onion flavored macadamias, I was floored. Macadamias, sea salt, onion powder, garlic powder, parsley, that's it. Simple, delicious, and their chocolate dipped macadamias, no words. Well, actually I do have a few words, low carb, high fat, antioxidant rich. I'm just salivating thinking of them right now, but sadly I had my last bag yesterday, but I have a coupon code that I'll be using for my next order and you can use it too. I'll share it with you in just a second. Why macadamias? Why not other nuts? Well, macadamias are loaded with monounsaturated fat, more than olive oil, 27% less carbs than almonds, 50% less carbs than cashews. Their nutrient profile is keto, like perfectly keto. And House of Macadamias aren't the run of the mill macadamia nut. I used to get mine from Costco, but not anymore. You can tell the quality behind House of Macadamia products, selecting only the best of the best nuts sourced from over 90 independent farms produced in rich soil with clean mountain water and mild temperatures. Okay, for that coupon code, visit houseofmacadamias.com slash KDP and use the coupon code KDP20 for 20% off your first purchase. Once more, that's houseofmacadamias.com slash KDP and use the coupon code KDP20 for 20% off your first purchase. Enjoy! Yeah, no, that's perfect. And I thank you so much for that because everybody sort of explains it a little bit different and you just have a wonderful way of doing it simply, which is a true compliment. If there could be any one compliment for somebody being able to impart information, if you can do it in a way that a kid can understand, like you are expert at it. So thanks. Thanks for that. And and I love that you mentioned the, the part about how generally speaking, glucose or carbohydrates for that matter, which turn into glucose in the body are a, are a sort of dirtier, if you will, I'm using some air quotes here. Um, because they, they burn in a way that creates a lot of inflammation. And we know that inflammation is not our friend in the long term. In the short term, if we're trying to heal from an injury, a fall, a wound, all of that, a quick, uh, short infection, what have you, inflammation is, of course, our friend. That's acute inflammation. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the inflammation of a chronic nature that's going on day after day, week after week, month after month. And when you eat a heavily you know, carbohydrate-laden diet, as we know, it tends to contribute to that ongoing inflammation, which is basically the root of every illness you can think of, from diabetes to heart disease to cancer to neurodegenerative stuff. So, so I love how you included that in your explanation, because I feel like that's one of the most important things to, to kind of remember is that one is a cleaner fuel than the other. And also, like you mentioned, it's longer lasting. You don't get hangry and, and sort of the, the litmus test. I like to tell people they can check like overnight if they're metabolically flexible or not is when you wake up in the morning, just don't eat for a few hours, make that a 12, 14, 16, 18 hour fast from your overnight. You already got half of it for free, right? Because you, you were sleeping. And if you don't get hangry and you can go for several more hours, say 16, 18 hours or more and not get hangry, then you're metabolically flexible. And that's yes. kind of a good, easy litmus test with no you know, fancy device to measure your, your breath or your blood or your urine or all the ways that we <laughs> like to measure. <laughs> but, but you did mention something too about, I love how, when you talked about the flexibility piece is that's kind of the goal. I really feel like that's the goal because if you think of what we did millennia ago, hundreds or thousands of years ago, we ate whatever we could find, whatever was available to us. And we could easily switch between, you know, gathering the, the tubers under the ground that were highly starchy carbs, or if we had, you know, game that we were able to, you know, eat, whether it be some woolly mammoth, or who knows what they were eating thousands of years ago, but they were able to switch back and forth. Like it wasn't a big deal. So the cool thing is our body can do both and they and can do it well if we help it get to that point. So was there something for you when you first were being introduced for, I know for a lot of people who just start, at least in my experience,
experience, it can be a little rough initially. Maybe speak to that first month and, and what can people do to kind of limit the, you know, people talk about the keto flu and, you know, all of these other kind of not so awesome symptoms that sometimes, not always, but sometimes people experience when they move towards a low carb uh, diet. Yeah. So this is where, you know, in hindsight, I was dealing with mold illness at the time of starting the ketogenic diet. And I didn't even know until years and years and years later. And that's probably why I had such a hard time getting adapted and feeling good beyond those 30 days. And we could definitely talk about that. But if you're one of those people listening and you're like, I don't even know how you do the ketogenic diet because I felt like absolute garbage on it. <laughs> there should be a period of time where you don't feel so good because it is kind of painful to move your body over. And there are definitely things you can help. But if it goes beyond like a couple of weeks, there might be another root cause kind of limiting your ability to move through that. And if we have time today, I'd love to talk about that. So in those first couple of days, like the first day, you're going to feel kind of dangerous and awesome. Like, look at me, I'm eating all this fat. This is great. Um, but then it kind of sets in like the first evening, you're like, okay, I could really go for insert thing here, bag of chips, cheeseburger, like fries, whatever you want to think of. I find by like day three, things start to get a little bit better. The best way you can blow through your glycogen, which is how your body stores glucose is to do high intensity interval training, especially those first couple days, like just blast through it like three days in a row. If you can short little bursts of exercise to just get through that glycogen so that you can switch over to ketosis a lot faster. A lot of people do super well on exogenous ketones those first couple of days or weeks, depending on their body. I really like the ones from Perfect Keto. There are other options, but some of them can get kind of expensive. I would start really low and slow with these because they can hurt your stomach and it's a lot to handle for some people, but that can kind of give you a taste of what life is going to feel like beyond those first couple of days where a lot of people report. I know that I felt like absolute death. Like there was a period of time where I thought I wasn't going to make it. And that probably had a lot to do with the fact that I wasn't hydrating properly. So I didn't know that your body needed more electrolytes on a ketogenic diet. And so I was just drinking my regular water and I was not hydrating properly. And I was so thirsty and I just couldn't satiate that thirst. So I suggest what, even before you start the ketogenic diet, a couple of days before, start to incorporate more electrolytes, switch out your gross salt for like the good stuff. Your listeners probably know what that is already, but like gray sea salt or pink salt, just something that's a lot better and start adding a little bit to your water if you want, or switch to an electrolyte powder that's ideally not sweetened because a lot of that stuff is absolute garbage. So check the ingredients and make sure that they're good. I really like element, but everyone has their preferences. And those are kind of like the main big, like the big things where I find those are the three items that if you do those, you're going to feel better. And then it's just about persevering. Maybe don't plan like a restaurant meal on day five because you will buckle. Like you just don't have, like you're like a little fawn in, in the forest. Like you're still tripping over yourself. So give yourself some grace with that. There are so many resources online of like how to order keto at Starbucks, how to all that stuff. But that stuff can bring in a lot of extra carbs and a lot of confusion. Basically, if in your mind you say, all I'm going to eat is fat and meat and vegetables, you're usually pretty good. Um, and just slowly but progressively work to lower your carbs. You don't have to be 20 grams of carbs per day out the gate day one, hardcore, maybe start at like 70 and then go to 50 and then go to 40 and track your meals and get a sense of things. Because I can, I can tell you, I've seen enough of this over. Well, I've been in the space 15 years. People go so hard out the gate. They last five days and they're like, no, nope, it wasn't for me. And it's just like, you did, it was just way too hardcore. You have to set this up. Like you're going to be doing this and trying to figure out how to make this work long-term. And it's just not practical to like go all the way that's at least what I experience, yeah. And I'm a pretty hardcore person. And even I <laughs> didn't go all the way out the gate. So that says a lot because yeah. usually I do with things. Yeah, no, I, I remember reading that you were into marathons before. And uh, I, anybody that does that routinely, like more than one is hardcore in <laughs> even one. I mean, 
mean, let's just be honest. I think a marathon is pretty darn hardcore. And, and I love your advice because just to go slow, you don't have to go from a hundred carbs a day or 150, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of what a lot of people eat per day down to, you know, 20 on your first day. Like that's just kind of ridiculous. Anyway, it doesn't even sound, you know, health, healthy or safe or, or what have you. And it's certainly extreme. And you, if you want to feel really bad, that's the way to do it. But try, try to, why do we want to, you know, we don't want to feel really bad. I mean, we want to know something's happening. I think sometimes that's kind of cool. You're like, Oh, cool. Yeah. I noticed something's changing. And if it's a little bit of pain in the beginning, that's okay. But the things you mentioned, I found as well, especially hydration is super critical. Um, especially adding some electrolytes because, uh, yeah, if you're strictly keto, it's, you know, you're going to want to add that cause you're not eating all of the crap, all the processed foods, which have a lot of added, uh, sodium, especially. And so having something like you mentioned, element T is a great, uh, uh, one, but there's lots of others that are out there that are unsweetened or that at least don't have any sugar or carbs in them. I think Rob Wolf came up with the element T years back and he, he's a cool guy anyway. In fact, he's coming onto my podcast. I think it's next week or something, but, uh, any of those, uh, versions that are basically real, you know, natural minerals that don't have a bunch of added stuff, because if you just buy it, uh, like in a seven 11 or some convenience store, a sports drink, like 99% of those are total garbage. Don't drink vitamin <laughs> water and Gatorade doesn't count. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. Let's just, <laughs> Let's just say yeah. it like it is. Either it's a bunch of not so awesome carbs or it's a bunch of artificial stuff. Many of them are, are if they say low calorie, there's tons of artificial sweeteners, which are of course not awesome. They cause inflammation. They wreak havoc on your gut, like many exactly. not, not awesome things. So I love the fact that you mentioned the hydration piece and going slow. Cause I think those are two of the most critical. And typically when I see people do that, they don't struggle as much. And within a you know, few days, they're getting better within one to two weeks. I mean, they're pretty much golden. Like it usually doesn't take a long time to get adapted. But like you said, if it does, maybe you also need to look for something else possibly going on. Another underlying issue, like in your case, you had some old issues and stuff like that. So that's great advice. Thanks for sharing that with everybody. Um, let's speak a little bit about over the years, you've kind of experimented with, you know, going from more strict, you know, super low carb, probably less than 20 grams a day kind of thing to a more liberal approach. And you add some, uh, I think what you call carb ups, if you will, to that. Let's talk a little bit about that. And, you know, first generally, and then maybe add in after you speak in general terms, how that can relate, especially to women. Cause I know it's uh, very helpful in women too, to be much more or, or less strict, I should say. <laughs> yeah, completely. We don't want more strict. Although there are those types of women, like I, I like to see bodies in two different ways. One is like an excess body where they have like excess everything. Their vitality is usually higher. And then we have on the other side of the spectrum, they don't have any more vitality left. And so like being strict on that side of things just generally doesn't work. Um, but yeah, so when I personally started the ketogenic diet, like I said, I, I progressed lowered my carbohydrates. I got down to 20 grams total carbs per day. And I stuck there for about six months, which in retrospect was a terrible, horrible idea. I wouldn't suggest it at that time. I still had an eating disorder. And so I would go a certain period of time, trigger warning, and then binge and purge for two days and then go back to the ketogenic diet. It was not healthy. I blogged about it. I talked about it. I was really in a bad place. And I see that oftentimes, even if you don't have a diagnosed eating disorder, they'll go, we'll go right out the gate. We'll do really, really good quote unquote air quotes, and then totally go off the handle for one, two, three days, maybe even longer. And so I really noticed quickly that if I wanted to make this an actual healthy lifestyle and get my life on track, which is what I had wanted to do with the ketogenic diet for my hormones, I needed to allow those foods in. And so I started researching at what point in a cycle, even though I didn't have one at what point in your cycle would I maybe benefit from adding in more carbohydrates? And it really, I found went with progesterone. Okay. So if between days one to 10, we are eating a low carbohydrate diet, then as uh, estrogen starts to increase, okay, we're going to bring in more estrogen support foods that have higher carbohydrates. Then following ovulation, we're going to go low carb again, and then increasing carbohydrates at the end of our cycle. And when I started doing that and really understanding at that point, I didn't have a cycle. So therefore I was using the moon cycles. Okay. So when I was using the moon cycles, that's when things started to kind of come into, into balance for myself. And it gave me more 
ability to enjoy my diet without feeling too strict. I think I think strict for anything for too long can be I mean almost not just keto but in many things can be not healthy. I mean we got to listen to our body, we got to try to balance and the ebb and the flow is important. And so you found that the back half of the cycle is tends to be having some, you know, carb ups if you will. Maybe explain that that for us. What do you mean by carb ups exactly? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so I found that we all know that if we have carbohydrates first thing in the morning, don't we want so many more carbohydrates? And that can be another sign that we're not metabolically flexible. So at the beginning of the co- recording, I was saying, yeah, I had potatoes for breakfast and now I had a macadamia keto bar and I'll be good for the day. I couldn't do that years ago. Like if I had any sort of carbohydrate in the morning, I was like, carbs for snack, carbs for lunch, carbs for snack, carbs for dinner. <laughs> and so that can kind of be a sign that you're not metabolically flexible and that's okay. You're not broke. In. We're just wanting to understand that if you have carbs in the morning, you're going to have carbs all day. So if we have carbs in the evening, we can kind of blunt that response and help our bodies nourish ourselves with specific nutrients. I'm not talking about what was his name years ago? Like, was it Kiefer something Kiefer? And he was like the cherry turnover guy. And he said, like, if you work out on a ketogenic diet and then ate all the cherry turnovers, <laughs> you'd have like great results. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, so we're using uh, strategic foods to help support our estrogen and progesterone and doing it at night so that you kind of like sleep through, like what you were saying, you're sleeping through your fast, you wake up, you fast a little bit longer, and then you're good for the day. You're sleeping through what you would normally want more carbohydrates so that you're getting a little bit and you're being strategic with it, but you're not overdoing it, which many of us do. I know I can or did. I don't so much anymore because yeah. things are pretty balanced. <laughs> yeah, important. And there's the reason how people exactly said you are not broken. You are perfect. You're perfectly created. There's so many knows how to do stuff, but sometimes don't let it. And if we roll out of bed and we reach for all usual breakfast foods that we've been told are okay, the cereals, the toast, the bagels, the croissants, all those things, not going to be awesome because he's already in the morning because of eyes and cord little bit in resistant up in the morning. So it's time to have call when you first wake up because you'll have a more extreme, you know, the, the peak of and glucose extreme more more patient than you could if you ate it later in the day as well. And so our bodies are set up to not really roll out of e car trying to eat them, like you said, especially later in the evening is probably the and the least problematic for insulin resistance. And then also you have that whole evening where your body is trying to rejuvenate. It's trying to refresh. It's trying to flush out all the toxins. It's trying to grow in the appropriate ways. The growth hormone gets released at night, for example. And all these naturally occurring mechanisms, including the autophagy, which happens when you don't eat, they're all happening at night. And so the evening sort of carb up is the perfect time to do it. And then it doesn't you know, begat another carb up. Like you said, if you start in the morning, you're going to sort of want to have more and more and more carbs throughout the day. And it, you don't have that problem problem really when you when you eat them at night. I, I found that to be the case with myself and those that I've worked with as well. So I I think that's golden. Thanks for sharing that. With respect to the cycle as well, what would you say? So you've mentioned towards the end of the cycle tends to be a better time to add in the carbs. Is there I remember hearing you say that also sort of that ovulation maybe there might be a day or two before or I forget to uh, Tell me your yeah. thoughts with that. Part. Yeah, you bet. So let's just go through the cycle quickly and talk about, because a lot of people don't know what's the start of my cycle, what's day one. And I get a lot of questions about that. So day one is the first day that you bleed. Okay. So from day one to 10, right before ovulation, because you usually ovulate around day 14. So day one to 10, low carb, ketogenic, you're great. Then from day like 11 to 14 or so, maybe a day after ovulation in that window, good to incorporate carbohydrates. Then you go low carb again. Okay. So following ovulation, you go low carb again for a couple of days. And then around day 18, 19, 20 ish, you start increasing your carbohydrates again until you bleed and then you do it all over again. And so if you're not bleeding, like I mentioned, then it becomes 
okay, use the moon, choose a moon cycle. So maybe the full moon is your ovulation and the new moon is your period. And that's what I did for a long time. I was like, okay, I just priming my body to be in somewhat of a cycle. Like I cycled everything, like my workouts and my food and just telling the body, see, we do a cycle thing. And that was really, really helpful, not only physically, but I think mentally too, to like prime my body for that natural cycle. I remember when my husband and I bought our first RV, I was really pumped about having a little cubby in the RV dedicated to snacks. I really love snacks and throughout my ketogenic life, I know what they say. You don't even need to snack. You're so free free from food, but I, I like snacking. I really enjoy snacks. And up until a couple of years ago, my snacks really were comprised of bars, like protein bars and nut butter packets. But when Paleo Valley came out with their meat sticks, game changer. I love, 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 love Paleo Valley meat sticks for so many different reasons, including the fact that they travel well. They're packed with probiotics. They're fermented beef sticks. They're not those chewy jerky like sticks and meat bars that are just gross. Oh, I don't enjoy those very much. They're soft and good and the flavors are on point. Mm, I'm honestly just salivating thinking about it. You can go to paleovalley.com and use the coupon code KETO, all in caps, to receive 15% off your first order. Again, that's paleovalley.com All uppercase keto is the coupon code to receive 15% off your order. Definitely load up on those sticks. They're some of my favorite snacks. Well, one of my favorite snacks. I have two in my purse all the time. I've shared them with friends and family, gotten everyone in love with these things. They're so tasty. Your kids are going to love them. Your husband's going to love them. You're going to love them. They're really, really good. And they have some really great subscription products up there to save a good amount of money on these sticks. So again, that's paleovalley.com coupon code keto. Enjoy. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love it how you mentioned the moon. And I, there actually is science to that. So the lunar cycle is a 28-day cycle. And when you or other women are you know, doing well with your hormonal balance, your cycle is also 28 days. So you definitely... like I know you say you don't, you don't necessarily hear about evidence for that, but I'm telling you right now from yeah. a doctor, there is evidence for that. It's a 28-day cycle, both lunar as well as generally speaking, when you're in your hormonal balance, the women's cycle is about 28 days too. So I love it. There is actually perfect harmony there. So (laughs) there really is. There really is. And depending on the type of person you are, some people will ovulate at the full moon. Some people will ovulate at the new moon. And it doesn't mean that it's wrong or you need to change it. It's just become curious about that. And you might find the more time you spend outside grounding time in nature, you might actually sink your cycle to the moon. And that is the craziest thing. Like, I just, (laughs) I just love that. (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. You mentioned another one of my favorite things, the grounding thing. Just take your shoes off, take your socks off, walk around barefoot. If you can at a beach or a lake or someplace like that, where it's really cozy and comfortable. Amazing. If you can just do it in the grass or even on the cement, that's fine too. Uh, grounding is so awesome. So another thing that I know you've experimented with a lot and talked to folks a lot about is sort of this fasting component. A lot of the craze, right? Is the intermittent fasting, maybe speak to how that may uh, play out with keto and with women. Like what's your experience there? Yeah. So the exact same template with carb up, you would use for fasting. So again, those days 11 to 14, and then day 18 or 19 onward, you don't want to fast. Okay, so those are the times where your hormones are working really well, they need fuel, you need fuel, you're probably more hungry, like most women report right before ovulation and right before our period, we are just hungry beasts. And that's part of it. And that's totally okay. And I think when we have that, you know, the number one issue I have with my keto clients is that they say, but I'm so hungry and I'm in a fast. I'm like, what day of your cycle are you at? And they always say stuff like day 26 or day 14. And I'm like, you should not be doing a fast today. Like stop, break your fast, have some food. And I think another huge misconception about fasting, and you might disagree with me, some people do, and it's okay. Specifically for women, I don't think that we should be using 
fatty coffee fasts all the time, maybe once a week, if you really, really love it. I used to share something called a rocket fuel latte. I still love those lattes, but I was doing fatty coffees every morning, every day. And while that will help regulate your blood sugar, which is a great added bonus. And if that's where you're at, that's awesome. It's not going to help autophagy long-term. And so I would much, much, much rather that my clients do like one or two water only fasts a week, where for 14 to 18 hours, we're doing just water, not coffee, not fatty coffee, not keto bricks, not none of that, like just water. And so that shift in and of itself, even now that I've overcome a lot of health issues, I do a water only fast once, maybe twice a week. And that's really all I need. And then I'm actually oh, gasp having breakfast or and that breakfast might be a little bit later in the day. And my eating window might be a little bit shorter, but, oh, so many women are eating like six hour days, eight hour days, every day, fatty coffees in the morning. And it's just, it's, it's not working. It's not yeah. working. It's it's also not natural. And, and, and lo siento, sorry, Dave Asprey. I know, you know, you've made your career off of this, but I agree with you, Leanne. I actually, I a hundred percent agree to actually have that true fast where you can get all of the benefits of autophagy it's got to be zero calorie. Like that's yeah. just the way it is. I mean, and, but the cool thing is you don't have to do it every single day. You don't yeah. have to do it all. You know, if you incorporate it a couple of times a week, fantastic. And I think what you said for the coordination with the cycle is golden because I know what I've seen is in a lot of women, they, you know, they see that, Hey, it's working. I like intermittent fasting, but then they go to the extreme and they intermittent fast like every single day forever. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't do it every single day. Even as a dude who doesn't have a cycle, I don't, do it every day. <laughs> I, I, I find that it's good to mix it up and to not, cause your body, there's another thing that you didn't even mention, but if you do prolong that eating, you know, have these long windows where you're, we're stacking only like say a six hour eating window or a four hour window, because 18 or 20 hours you're fasting. You're also getting your body used to this low caloric state to yeah. where it becomes adapted to the low caloric state. And it says, Hey, I'm in this kind of like starvation mode. I'm actually going to hold on to those calories even tighter and it's going to be harder to burn them off. And that's been actually scientifically shown that's called metabolic adaptation. And so it's actually very good to mix it up, to do everything exactly the same. And especially a real strict form every day. It's not good for this guy up here. It's not good for the mental health, but it's also not good for your body. The body likes flexibility. It likes the, you know, variety. I always tell people variety is not only the spice of life for all the other things, but it is for the way that we eat, for what we eat, all these kinds of things too. So thank you so much. I think it makes it simple for women, especially to coordinate it with their cycle because so many struggle with, you know, they start the intermittent fasting thing. They're like, well, how come it's not working? And usually yeah. I find it's because they're doing it every single day and they're overdoing it. <laughs> I've been there. Like, thank you for that. No judgment. I did it for like way too long. And you're right. My body had a really hard time. I was sitting at like 1200 calories. I wasn't losing weight. I wasn't performing well. Now, I mean, I don't count, but I range anywhere between 1400 calories a day to like 4,000 calories a day. And for the first time ever, I mean, I'm growing muscle like I never could before. And so it's a natural progression, but I agree with you. It's like, yeah, guilty, guilty as yeah. charged. I've done having it. the having the flexibility and variety. It there's science to it. The metabolic adaptation I spoke to was the reason that even on 1,200 calories you weren't losing the weight and that kind of thing because your body yeah. was like, holy crap, I'm in this starvation we're mode. Dying. And you were designed to be able to withstand starvation. Like that's why we have fat in the first place, and that's why it's located around the middle because it doesn't get in the way of most of the things that we need to do with our legs and walking and arms grabbing fruits or digging for them or whatever, like this is all perfectly designed. But when we try to outsmart the body, that's where we get messed up. I think we just yeah. need to kind of, you know, move the, move the clock backwards and try to go, okay, how did they do it back then? Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. We can eat when our body tells us and fasting overnight makes perfect sense. You know, all these kinds of things. So with respect to women, we've talked a lot about the cycle. What are your thoughts on keto and menopause and sort of hormonal things with low carb during menopause or, or perimenopause or post, you know, right in that phase of life? 
life. What has your experience been with respect to that? Yeah. Okay. So many thoughts. I'll keep it <laughs> as simple as I can. The good news is once you've experienced your me- menopause and you're like post menopause, you're not getting a cycle. It's been 12 months. It's awesome because you don't have to, you know, pay attention to the carbohydrates as much and the movement as much. And you kind of get into the groove. You no longer have that cyclical hormone cycle, though. I will say the number one issue I see with women who are experiencing menopause, who are kind of at that cusp, their cycles are starting to get a little bit wonky is that your adrenals are going to start to take over the role of hormone management a lot more. And if you're going into this totally stressed out, you might not have the best experience as you reach your postmenopausal stage. And so I actually got an Instagram message this morning. A lady was saying that she was disappointed with my suggestion that in your thirties, you should start to think about what menopause is going to look like for you. And I don't take that back because I'm 36 and I am constantly, not constantly, but I definitely have in my mind, how am I going to set this up so that my hormones going into this experience, because it'll happen and hopefully never, but that's just my dream. But that your adrenals need to be good. Your DHEA needs to be great. And that's part of the adrenal piece too. Estrogen and progesterone imbalance, not too high estrogen. That's usually the issue and that ratio. And so there are things you can do in preparation for that. I highly recommend that every woman get a Dutch test at least one time before they're 40. So they can start to kind of look at things and then So you've gone three months without a cycle. I would definitely suggest getting your blood hormones taken, seeing if there's anything that you can do, support your liver, support your liver, support your liver. Castor oil packs work great for most people to just start thinking regardless of where you're at, to just start supporting your liver, your liver and your gut are the places where the hormones happen, um, liver especially. And so if you're, if you've had a life of lots of sugar and all sorts of things, it's not not too late to really support your liver. You just might find during that process, as you start to notice that your cycles are changing, it might be more challenging for you to maintain your ketones. It's totally natural. And once you kind of hit that menopause stage, 12 months without a cycle, you're going to start to notice that you're able to generate a little bit more ketones. I've found that most menopausal women or post-menopause rather, don't generate as many ketones as a woman, say in her thirties. I don't entirely know why that is, but that's not to say you can't burn fat. And once you experience that, once you've gone through 12 months without a cycle, again, things kind of open up for you. You don't have to eat carbs at a certain time or work out at a certain time. You just kind of like every day is kind of the same. So it opens up a lot. And I find they're able to fast a lot longer, which is great. Whereas somebody, who's maybe in their 30s or early 40s could go maybe more than 18 hours. A woman who's experienced menopause can do like 24 hour fasts, like a couple times a month. So that that can be really fun for them too. Yeah, no, that that's great. And I love how you said that we should kind of be thinking or have it on our radar, you know, just to kind of be prepared because, you know, these changes can happen at any time. And, and you know, yes, the average age is the latter part of the, of the fifth decade or the latter 40s, but it can happen anytime. So why not be prepared for it? There is that simplicity, like you said, once you're 12 months out after not having your period and you're fully into the menopausal period that you, you know, it's just a little bit simple. You're, you're, you're not having yeah. the big swings that you had during, during the years of, of menorrhea when you're having the monthly cycles. And that's, I think a lot of people kind of like that part, you know, they, once they get adapted and they kind of get used to how things are going like that's, and, and this whole thing you mentioned about the numbers, like of the level of ketones being a little bit harder to get to those same levels in those ages post menopausal. I've seen that as well. And that's nothing to be like, you know, like, Oh my gosh, this is, I'm all, I'm, I'm totally against this kind of like merit badge thing. Like here I am. I got I higher ketones than you. Like, I just think that's so lame, you know, like we're all in a different place of our lives. And if we're in the functionality of ketosis and our body, like for me, just when I go overnight and I don't eat anything, I'm in ketosis. My levels might not be through the roof, but who cares? I can burn fat. Yeah. I can go out and do my morning workout and have that actually be effective at burning fat. If that's what I want want to do. It doesn't matter the level. So like the whole level thing, I hope people are finally getting the, 
getting, I, I don't know. I, I feel like in the, in the sort of social media space, there's still a lot of bragging about levels yeah. and this and that thing. And I just, I don't think that that's helpful. What's been your experience with, with the chasing the level? <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I mean, I try to educate my clients as best I can with it, but it's so hard when they're hearing like ongoing, you know, your ketones need to be between this and that. And if they're not, you're not burning fat. I mean, I've met plenty of women who are generating ample ketones and not losing weight. I haven't seen a correlation between the two. I think neurologically, like if you're thinking of like brain fog and ability to focus and that sort of thing, I think sometimes the deeper ketones, sometimes the better, but like you need to ask yourself, why are you doing this? Right. And I, I don't think that a number one goal should be weight loss. I've never seen that be overly effective for people. If it's that you want to lose weight because you want to run around with your grandkids and that the idea of playing tag with your grandkids just makes you so excited, then that needs to be your why. And when you're worried about your ketones not being too, check in with yourself. If my ketones are not too, can I still run around with my grandkids? You know, like just reframe our mindset. And I think, cause you know, I'm guilty of it too. I look on social media. I'm like, oh, like she has it all figured out. Like she, but I remind my clients of this often, you know, uh, with my reels and things that I post and they're like, why did you say it like this? And I'm like, Oh, my life is not perfect at all. I think we like lose sense of the fact that the people that we're seeing on our phones are real people with real problems. And it's so much easier to just like hyper focus on a number. If it's not calories and it's carbohydrates, if it's not carbohydrates, it's our ketones. If it's not that it's our CGM monitors. And these can be great data inputs. And there are people that can just say, Oh yeah, my ketones are 0.5. It doesn't matter. But if you're neurotic, like I am, um, it can be really triggering. And so you need to check in with yourself and ask like, is this triggering me and stopping? Like, am I, is it affecting me mentally? And usually the answer is yes. If I take away those ketone monitors and I ask my clients like, Hey, just track how you're feeling on a daily basis. I'm like, I'm feeling great. Everything's good, you know, but as soon as you bring in some of those monitors, it can actually make you doubt your choices. And there needs to be this balance between data is great. And it can tell you when you've like overdone it, or maybe you didn't feel a certain thing and you can ask yourself questions, but it really depends on the type of person that you are. For myself personally, I'll wear a CGM for a couple of weeks and be like, Oh yeah, blackberries. I can't do those. They spike my glucose like crazy and make me crave. Okay, good data point. But when it starts to be like obsessive and I'm, I'm updating the app every couple of seconds, I'm like, what now? What now? What's it at now? Then like, I need to kind of check in and be like, what are my goals? Why am I doing this? And that can kind of bring you back to your center point. I really hope you're enjoying today's episode. I'd love to see where you're listening from. You can snap a pic and tag me at Leanne Vogel or leave a review for the show on your favorite podcast player. It helps me out tremendously. Okay, back to the good stuff. No, so so much value there. And I love how you also related it to other things that we like to track, whether that be our weight or, you know, whatever, whatever those things are, because I think there's a lot to that. And you said something that I love, love, love to share with people is I like to be more focused on the outcome of functionality. What do I want to be able to do? Like you said, you want to be able to go for a walk with your grandkids or go play tag with them or be able to pick them up off the floor and carry them around. Like those things are endpoints that to me are more valuable. And I think people that that really take a moment to think about it, they are to them as well. Because like, if you're just chasing a number on the scale, the habits that you usually will use to get to that number on the scale are not the type of habits that you're going to want to be using for the rest of your life. And if you just focus on first, you know, what do you really want? What do you want to be able to do? And then making lifestyle choices that are consistent with that, the weight's going to come into play by itself. You don't even have to think about losing weight. And I couldn't agree more with that whole, you know, start of this, you know, this, this uh, point where you said, don't use keto quote unquote, to just lose weight. Like that's, then it's just one of those diet things. And there's so many of those out there and they all don't work well in the end. So just adopting something to your lifestyle that meets your goals. And I want to, maybe you can kind of close with this. Cause I know you've talked about recently, maybe in the last several months, you're definitely not the hardcore keto 
that you were before. Tell us a little bit about how that occurred and what your thoughts are, just big picture stuff. I know we kind of alluded to the metabolic flexibility, which I think is so critical, but just give me a little bit your experience and your thoughts looking at it a different way. Yeah. So um, this conversation also applies to people when they just heard all this stuff and they're like, yeah, but I'm doing everything and it's not working and I'm not losing weight and I don't even understand. And I feel like garbage that I know keto is good for me. There could be another root cause playing into all of this. And for me, it was a soup of a bunch of different things, including mold and parasites and a little bit of lime and lime, which is Borrelia. And so I was kind of exposed to all this stuff around the time that I had started the ketogenic diet and a couple of years before. And so this didn't kind of come to a forefront until 2020, where I was having terrible digestion issues. And so I did a stool test and sure enough, I had a pathogenic parasite and I started looking through my blood work because I can, I can look at blood work and determine and parasitic patterns because I went to school for it and I just really, really love it. And sure enough, I had had a parasite pattern in my blood work since 2011. So um, that kind of made me reframe a lot of things. And I started seeing, oh, that's why I couldn't eat super low carb that whole time because I had mole illness. That makes a lot of sense. Oh, that's why this didn't work. Or when I did this protocol, I started herxing. And so things started coming into play. And I just decided I couldn't eat the specific nutrients I needed to to get my liver a lot better to help me with this process. And I couldn't be in a deep state of ketosis if I wanted my liver to be better. And so I made the choice to stop eating a ketogenic diet and then announce it to the world, which made a lot of people really upset with me. But you know, I've done this many times. And really, that's why I named my well, my dad actually named my business Healthful Pursuit, because he's like, you're not going to stick to one thing, Leanne, I know you like, <laughs> this is going to be an evolving process. And I still use keto in my practice, I can still speak to it. I've written three paperback books, international bestselling, like, I know the ketogenic diet. And and so for two, almost two years, I stopped eating keto and it was more of a paleo thing. I killed off the parasites. I cleared out the mold. I'm just about done with Borrelia stuff. I have a little bit more to go and now I'm eating keto again. And it's kind of like this merge thing where I'm doing more fasting and in the evenings, more than the mornings, I'm kind of playing around with different things, but I have far more metabolic flexibility. I mean, it's incredible. Incredible. I thought for sure getting back on keto these last couple of months, it would be pretty hard because I remember the first time I did it, it was terrible and it was fine. Like I started eating keto and I felt really no different, really. Um, my mind has been a lot better, but I didn't feel anything bad. <laughs> so it was a really fun experience, you know, because in our heads as people that have maybe been keto for a little while, we're like, what if I go off? What's going to happen? How hard is it going to be to get back on? And it, it wasn't that way at all. So the last couple of months, I've been playing around with it with more metabolic flexibility. Um, and I just, I, I knew that I really needed that time. And I knew that I couldn't do both. And that's a decision that I made for myself. It's a decision that I guide people through that I work with of just like, is the ketogenic diet or the carnivore diet or the vegan diet or the paleo diet, whatever they're doing, FODMAP, all the specific carbohydrate. Is this what you need both physically, mentally, emotionally with where you're at right now? Or do we need to take a little break? And that that's totally okay. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions around all of that. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and I think the underlying theme is kind of what you started with that being metabolically flexible, you can really adapt to whatever the source of food or energy is as long yeah. as it's I think we, we can agree that as long as you're eating real food, like the one ingredient stuff that doesn't even need a label, like if you're eating real food, you don't really need to worry so much about the nuance of this many grams of this or this percentage, like whatever's working for you. And if you're thriving, listen to your body, if you're flexible, like it's fine, just avoid, you know, the evil triad, I like to say the processed grains, right? All the processed sugars, number two, the, the high fructose corn syrup, all that garbage. And then of course the seed oils. Now, if you can avoid those three things and just eat real food, we're all going to be better off. It doesn't yeah. matter which sort of scheme you pick, whether it's paleo, vegan, carnivore, like whatever, you know, whatever your body is thriving off of. I encourage people to do that. I, I hate it when people get so polarized to one edge of the, the spectrum or another, just eat what is appropriate. That's real. Whatever is real food that your body does well on. If you're thriving. Hey, don't let me tell you what, you know, thriving is what we all want to do. So <laughs> thank you for yeah. that. Uh, tell us how we can um, find you, reach out to you, work with you, all of that fun stuff. And then we'll let you get on to 
your busy day. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. So I'm most active on Instagram at Leanne Vogel. That's L-E-A-N-N-E V as in Victor O-G-E-L. So that's where I post reels and have a lot of fun. I just discovered the green screen and it's like blowing my mind right now. And then I have a podcast, The Keto Diet Podcast, where I come up with episodes every week. And um, my website is healthfulpursuit.com. Um, and that's where my coaching is. I have digital programs and books and all sorts of things about all the way from keto to functional blood chemistry to mold illness. I kind of cover it all functional wellness style. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Awesome. And we'll post all that up in the show notes. And yeah, your podcast, The Keto Diet is amazing. I've listened to many episodes. Thank you for doing that. You do an amazing job. Keep crushing it. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. So I shared a bunch of different things in here, including resources and stuff. Probably the number one resource, if you're like, Leanne, I want to go deeper into this stuff that you're talking about. The best way to do this is to go to healthfulpursuit.com slash six week. That's the number six week. I've put together a six week program geared toward exactly this, how to eat keto for your cycle, how to adjust your carbohydrates, what that looks like, what carbohydrate carb ups rather look like and how to structure this. I provide you with a personalized plan and the whole bit. So yeah, again, it's healthfulpursuit.com slash six week. That's the number six week. I hope to see you over there. Okay. That does it for another episode of the keto diet podcast. I'll see you back here next Tuesday. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. Music for the Keto Diet Podcast provided by Yechi. Follow Jacob on Instagram at Yechi underscore official and on Spotify as Yechi. That's Y-E-C-H-I. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.